Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In these last days, in these last weeks, as riots and fire have invaded our city following the death of George Floyd, presiding Bishop Michael Curry offered a pastoral word to the church, and he invited us to have hope and love for our future. He says that dealing with the issues of race in this country are going to take longer than a weekend, and all of this will require of us to lean into the way of love and engage the way of love. Moreover, that the Episcopal Church itself is here and going to work shoulder to shoulder with people in our community to bring about change. As we continue this work, I thought, we need to remember that the gospel work, the gospel itself is embodied. One of the deepest principles of our modern Western culture is the responsibility of governments to its citizens. There is a kind of citizen's consent, if you will, to the form of government, but there's also a consent that the government will have a responsibility. Uh, this is part of the trade, if you will, for the consent. will have a responsibility to protect the individual's body and the individual's property. The principle, it turns out, is Anglican in its root. Its earliest thoughts are to be found in the writings of Richard Hooker, who would eventually influence John Locke in his work, Hooker's uh, Laws of Ecclesiastical Polity, a great Anglican theologian, a first architect, if you will, of modern moral society and the purposes of government. Now, we know that such a grand vision has not always been upheld by our church, the Anglicans and Episcopalians, or Christians either. We have supported white supremacy and slavery. We have also fought against uh, white supremacy uh, and slavery. Why is that? I think it's because... Hooker's vision has pulled us nevertheless forward. What is important to grasp is that that vision has a, a deep reason for making such a statement, and that is because God makes all human beings. This is what the book of Genesis reminds us, that we are God's and, and for God, uh, because God has made us and, and all there is. Uh, we are unique creatures. This uniqueness is important. Moreover, as the gospel authors do so well, we are to be reminded that our shape draws upon it the likeness of Christ himself, whereas the creed tells us all things came to be through the Christ. Every human body has infinite value then because it embodies the gospel. And these bodies are free from distortion no matter how hard society works to tell a different story. Even we cannot take away what God has given. We cannot disembody God's embodied gospel and creation. This means that we cannot separate out, for instance, protection of goods as if they were more valuable than the protection of bodies. We in the West, I fear, are entangled in a process, new capitalism of the virtual, of creating a disembodied self, a virtual life, a buffered internal independent mind. This disembodied self often retreats from the world and from each other, maybe even living in like-minded tribes. And one characteristic of this is a greater concern about property and goods than people who use them. It is an internal uh, vision of the world rather than one that 
helps us to see the embodiment of God's creation and gospel. This disembodied philosophy sees others, you, you can imagine, as an asset without dignity, without substance. Yet, a society must protect the individual body. It must see the community body and what the community body is saying. It must understand the diversity of bodies and take care of each other's bodies first. This is not the first time that we have seen individuals and organizations allow for the mistreatment and the denigration of the human body. No, it is a legacy in this country to treat different bodies differently, to treat different properties differently even. And in recent years, we've sought, I, I fear, uh, to, uh, by our own desire, to separate out uh, from a dangerous world, uh, we have seen a rise in this disembodiment. We cannot begin to address to dismantle the institutional violence, nor much of the world's evils if we do not begin by re-embodying the gospel. All human beings have dignity, should be treated with dignity, and even when it comes to the institutions of government at every level, should speak uh, and act out of a sense of each other's dignity from a foundation that respects the dignity of the embodied creature of God, the human being. But the problem is that we've been raised in a system to think of bodies differently, to dehumanize the bodies, the black bodies and the brown bodies and the yellow bodies, the poor bodies, most especially so. Moreover, our unique deconstruction and disembodiment of God's dignity for the black body, well, that we have done disturbingly well. Today, without thinking, the black body is largely and subconsciously characterized as less than. This is rooted deeply in the first words used in this country for the black body, which was chattel. The idea that the black body was property. But that has woven itself through our narrative and come to be morphed so that what we see now is that the black body is a criminal body. This is part of America's psyche. We are, if you will, predisposed to it. It is our first thought oftentimes. It's the long tale of slavery and 400 years of denaturing the black body. The results of our denaturing, though, uh, have, have been in the news uh, lately, and we have not been able to avoid it no matter how hard we try. We see that black bodies, black bodies have not been treated with dignity. And the counter voice trying to remove life and their dignity has sought us out. It shut down and shamed peaceful protests not long ago, and the supporters of the disembodiment of certain people now call our attention to property. There is an active denaturing going on. George Floyd is not the first. We might name Breonna Taylor on March 13th in Kentucky or Armand Arbery on February 23rd in Georgia. The death of the black body is the expected story, a narrative now woven deep into the fabric of American life, a narrative whose end we may only glimpse in the present, though our prayers invite it to come. Soon. The fact that our gospel is an embodied gospel means that we must engage in a sympathetic understanding of the body of the other and our own. Also action. This is not someone else's work to do. This is your work. It is my work. It is our work to do. Now there are whispers that will say to us as we begin it, beware, beware. 
a disembodied philosophy will seek to explain to us how the gospel is really just about spiritual facts alone. Disembodiment seeks to dissuade us from speaking out, from acting out, especially when it contradicts the treatment, the normal treatment of the black body. As Martin Luther King said long ago, our lives begin to end the day that we become silent about things that matter. Meanwhile, the embodied gospel remembers, invites us, calls us to remember our anthropology, that it's incarnational, that God came embodied and countered the powers of, of, of that day with a new word, a living word that would be victorious. And even then, when it looked like all was lost, God's resurrection, God's transformation, God's redemption of the body was underway. The embodied gospel does not stay on the cross. On the, on the cross. It, it, it dies and redeemed, and it does not stay in the ground, but it is resurrected. Therefore, an embodied gospel is one that chooses to take an active role in the narrative making of this country, believing with hope, believing with hope in the dignity of all bodies. The embodied gospel has an imagination that remembers dignity and what it might mean to be a society that outgrows its old stories of disembodied peoples of color. The imagination of the embodied gospel sees ahead of us a society for friends and neighbors God's, of God's making and giving of dignity to all human beings, to all human beings. That is not a utopian vision. It is an achievable one. And in part, it is what it means to be a civilized society. We may have a long way to go together. We may have much work to do to get there. It may be very uncomfortable for us as we listen to our brothers and sisters and their voices of pain. It may take a massive amount of enacted imagination to move us out of the old narratives that bind us. But let me be clear. We will go nowhere if we do not begin by understanding bodies and their dignity, are to be protected by the community and the nation. The Reverend Kelly Brown Douglas reminds me of Rachel from the scriptures. The prophet Jeremiah wrote, a voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. We must all bond, join together, and wrap ourselves around the mothers and the fathers whose children have been disembodied from their dignity. And as Douglas writes, we must refuse to be consoled until... There is an end to our illegitimate fears that justify shooting, killing, and strangling the black body most of all. We must refuse to be consoled until there is no longer a culture that seeks to disembody others, that seeks to the disembodied of God-made dignity. We must reject a disembodied, silent gospel if there ever was a thing. And we must embrace together and seek to lean forward together, empowered, strengthened, and given hope by an embodied gospel.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.